rudiments of this material first featured in the presentation of Michael Lucas, my magic that I put on in the old library of Avalon upstairs in the courtyard in 1996. And when I first put this lecture on, not one single person turned up for it. So it's kind of nice that things have moved a little bit now and that everything is incorporated as was always the intention in um, my book, Out of Artists. Now, it's a good little story to tell, actually, because I got the opportunity to do this tonight at short notice because somebody cancelled, and this will form part of a really huge extended launch of this book. Now, the narrative um, concludes uh, on a weekend in February 1993, and I was able to launch it at uh, the Glastonbury Cold Conference a couple of weeks ago. Exactly 25 years old, and that's very, very satisfying, I'm sure you can appreciate. But what amuses me is that we're in here tonight rather than in the normal smaller hall. Uh, as part of the conference, uh, it was as if the contents of my book became psychoactive. And I talk about my, my rebirth and experience in 1992, and I talk about uh, being a shape into O'Shea Sanyas and Glastonbury, which I've talked to you about before, and our all involved hyperventilated and a general fit of screaming and depths. Well, in this very room, um, on that weekend, uh, just a couple of Sundays ago, Dave Lee of Chaos Imagined Fame uh, put on um, a workshop about Austin Austin Spare and the Dev Posture. I didn't really appreciate that essentially what it was going to be was a breath work session and Dave's got back ready for rebirthing and standards have growth and so on and he sets up the rebirthing session and I think at least a few people here are actually there for that uh, and I realised that this was an opportunity to set off the energy in May that is actually present all the way through this book and it would be really great to do that and so I completely went for it uh, we had a few rows facing that direction and after about 10 minutes I just <coughs> leapt up from my seat and ran over here and just started howling and shouting and laughing and pulsating and going into a right one. So it's kind of interesting, I feel some little continuity of that I like to think be present tonight. So yeah, okay, you know me, or well, a lot of you do. Uh, some of this stuff's going to be a bit weird, some of it's going to be a bit uncomfortable but it is the positive feeling group. Clearly, at the end of the night, I am hoping to put something forward that you actually feel has got some positivity there. So I'm going to tell you some stories that are very distinct. Each one of them uh, has got something about it you need to itself, but it's all in this broad spectrum of the very peculiar scenario when your TV starts leaking, when the borderline between fiction and magic and fact in your own life becomes very blurred. So we're going back to um, Robin Shirt, which I get a fading. It's probably quite likely that most of you will have seen this somewhere along the line. You may well have loved it to pieces back in the 80s when it first came out. It was something that really resonated with people and a lot of us really loved the way that Robin was portrayed as the son of the Horned God, her. And this is an idea that it comes from um, the works of Margaret Murray. Margaret Murray, uh, you know, theorist of witchcraft. We can't call her as a historian. Her theories have just been told to truth now. But the idea that um, some of the stories of Robin Hood uh, are actually um, telling us just a little bit about traditions of the witch cult, set a lot of people's heads off, uh, and was very, very fruitful. And for a number of people, uh, when we f first saw her you know, looming in the forest, uh, a hell of a lot of people just became instant pagans. The moment they saw this and the moment they heard the atmospheric planet music in the background, that was it, they cashed in their chips and it's still the case right now. And I guess we all wanted um, you know, to have an experience like that, that we're in this atmospheric ancient forest and the 
mist appear. It is swirling around. It is a bit of a clan song in the background. It's swirling. <laughs> now, if this stuff first was screened in 84, 85, I saw some of them. It was only when I became involved in the psychic question of, of Andrew Collins in the late 80s that I really started um, to just become completely and utterly immersed in this and the feeling that there was an authentic expression of a life of paganism was trying to work its way uh, through here. And yet, you know, there is that sense that obviously Heard is a deity, but he's also in some sense a human and there is that he's taking on the aspects of the deity. You, you know, you have these ancient uh, paintings in, in, in caves of people, you know, wearing the antlers costumes, they've been possessed by the deity. There's a whole load of stuff there in the way that her was portrayed that was able to set people off. And some of the stories, um, from the point of view of, of me and the Psychic Quest crew at the time, were very, very intriguing. There was a, one called the Hounds of Lucifer, and if you think you recognise that landscape, yeah, some of this was filmed at uh, Michael's Mount. And these guys who, who seem to be demons incarnate, they're actually humans working for this kind of uh, Luciferic cult or uh, at large in the landscape. And there's an amazing scene at the end where uh, Lucifer is raised in a ceremony, uh, which by the way is filmed in Wells Cathedral, uh, which didn't go down too well with a lot of people at the time, it has to be said. <laughs> Part of the thing about this story which really interested Andy Collins was it was about seven swords of Wayland. You know, the Saxon deity Wayland had, had forged these seven swords, one of which was Albion, and this, uh, this cult that was trying to raise Lucifer uh, were looking for these seven swords, Robin and Albion, and they tried to get hold of that. Now, obviously, at the time, I won't go into the details of it, probably most of you at least heard a little bit about the fact that there was this psychic quest of seven swords. And we thought, well, this is intriguing. Now, Richard Carpenter, who wrote most of this stuff, is obviously a chimney guy. Uh, something interesting going on there. Now, while this was going on, some of Andy's group, um, myself included, we kind of um, also, as a byline, uh, almost as if randomly, but not really, had got involved in just going out with full moments and pretty much doing a make-up, make your own, do it yourself, wicker up now. And you know, at that point, it was just all this kind of stuff about who's initiated to do this and do that. I just did not give a shit about any of that. All we were interested in was, let's go out in the woods on a full moon and just get a big circle of candles and let's do a visualisation and bring the goddess down. And you know, we started this off, we were in a place, in a place called Brentwood in Essex. And this is a blurry photograph of us. We love the barbecue candles. It was just absolutely stalking. But we were looking for somewhere for us to call our permanent base. Um, and all of this is, is, is in our girls, by the way. Now, I was living pretty near to Hatton Castle. And you know, it's a pretty damned atmospheric place. And it does look pretty good by moonlight. And there's this enormous great area uh, called Bentfleet Downs behind it that is now a country park. And if you see this picture looking the other way, across on the horizon, there's another hill. And there's like a clump of trees just on the left of that hill at the far horizon. This is a place that I have associations for that I thought would make a real good place to go out every full moon and on the ball, the, the solar festivals and so on and do a bit of a number out there. And took everybody over there and we all thought, yeah, let's do it. And the first thing that we got together was on the winter solstice 1989. So this was a great way to say goodbye to a big decade and usher in what we hope is going to be a big decade. Now, we were all Robert Shurer fans. We were all really, really into it and listening to the Clannet soundtrack out all the time and all the rest of it. And one of the people, Mike Stone, the group, Alex Langstone, features a, a lot in my Antigarics book. He got some antlers, okay, and he was itching for a chance to dress up as a <coughs> banana because we all wanted a bit of this, right? Of course we did. 
So we went out there uh, and, and checked the whole area out. And right on the top of that hill, there was um, a, a, an old, old tree that was kind of broken down and damaged, and, and the whole um, trunk was hollowed out. And you could basically stand in this, this tree, the trunk, um, pretty much sort of up to your shins in this thing. So we thought, okay, this, this is how we're going to play this. Alex would, would dress up as early, he'd have his anchors on, he'd have a big brown blanket around him, he'd brown his screaming space up, and he'd stand in his tree trunk, and we'd have a torch at his feet, and we had a smoke canister, uh, and we had um, a musician friend of ours who got his own studio song called Clanad, um, <laughs> and uh, it turned into like 20 minutes worth of all these atmospheric sounds. And the idea was, was basically, um, you know, that Alex would stand that early in the tree with the smoke and the light and the full effects, and we would all be kind of led to it, and he'd anoint our ears with this flying oil and some of that a hunting horn, and then we'd have the wild hunt and we'd just run around in the woods, you know, howling, screaming, and making lots of noise and throwing ourselves on the ground, whatever. You know, uh, that was the general idea of it. Uh, so, you know, first of all, it's a very fortunate thing when a group of people come together and, and you've got between you um, just the, the urge to just go along with anything and you've got some talent. You know, we had obviously the guy with the studio was able to produce this bit of plan head. And so we did this thing in a way um, that I worked it out. Uh, at one point, there, there's like a, a dip in the top of the hill, and I was going to take most of the people there. And then there was going to be this blast on this hunting hall, and you turn around and you look at the horizon, and you would see um, her standing there in the middle, and there were two of the girls in the group would be standing there with like hooded robes on, holding flaming torches up, and that would be a silhouette on the horizon. And I knew this was going to happen because I, it was my idea and I set the whole thing up. But when I saw it, when I saw it, my legs practically gave way. It was like seeing something that was like tens of thousands of years old. It was like this atavistic tingle through my whole body. It was absolutely and utterly awesome, you know, without any, any doubt whatsoever. So, yeah, this, this was the kind of caper that we got involved in. So you're like, yeah, that's fine, that's great, that's, that's good in itself. But what then ripples out from doing something like that? Now, a few months later, this was in April 1990, Andy Collins got a phone call from a guy that had read his book, The Black Alchemist, and he'd had some strange experiences. He was an actor, he was in California, he'd been um, under hypnosis and he'd remembered places that he'd spent his childhood at, places in Yorkshire. There was weird stuff going on. He felt that there was something that he sorted out, like the end could help him with this. So they had this long talk, and Andy was, was talking about questing and talking about things that seemed to be part of that general uh, vibe and, and other things with the same spirit. And he mentioned Robin Shield, and he mentioned Ricky Carpenter, uh, uh, and how much he rated all of this. And this guy that he was talking to uh, said to him, well, yeah, I know Robin Shield pretty well. I was in it, actually. And it turned out that it was, was Mark Ryan who played the, the Saracen uh, swordsman Nazir. And the zero was our favourite character, you know, and he had this very distinct fighting style. He had two swords that he had scattered over his back. Uh, we loved him, you know, and a lot happened very quickly. He, he went along uh, with Andy and with uh, the great psychic in the group, Debbie. There's an episode in Andy's book, The Seventh Sword, where they went up to, to Yorkshire and a whole lot of weird stuff happened and they made a connection with the goddess Ellen of the land. And you know, this was just, just a couple of them. And Mark said that he quite fancied the idea of coming along uh, and, and being part of an excursion with the whole large group. <coughs> and, uh, and we thought, yeah, fantastic. We got something to set up uh, a few weeks after that, uh, a place called Dovedale in, uh, in the Midlands, which is part of a quest that some was doing involving Gwaine and the Green Knight. And, and it all seemed absolutely incredible. Uh, um, what was intriguing about it was 
at that time there was talk um, of getting a movie of all the together and it never happened but the project kind of mutated and ended up as the Kevin Costner thing but basically Mark had still got his, his sword and still got, got a, a, a wasted, you know, what we've looked, can you bring him along, we'd love to see you with the swords and all the rest of it. So we're in this position where, you know, we're going to meet him and you know, that's, that's, if you just imagine him in everyday clothes, but he's looking exactly the same, the hair the same, the beard the same, and the silk slung over his back, you know, we were getting, we were thinking, this is how it's going to be. Now, the way that, that weekend worked out, some of us went in advance, uh, um, the mark was going to meet up with a bunch of the rest of us the next day, but a few of us ended up spending the night at the Nine Lady Stun Circle, in, in, in Derbyshire, and we got there really late, and it was just like, um, you know, stars, moon, no clouds, absolutely perfect, there's a few hippie wagons, um, parked around the place, and we, in the manner that we used to do in those days, just got our German army sleeping bags and sat, laid down right in the middle of this <coughs> circle, and started to drift off, and suddenly this music had come, you know, we've been there half an hour, it's been totally quiet, and suddenly this music comes out one of the hippie wagons, and it is, of course, the soundtrack of Robin and Sherwood. And they played practically, you know, the whole album. Uh, and we're all already starting to think, you know, something's coming up Blue Deal. What, what the hell is going on? So, yeah, the next day we meet Mark, and yeah, he looks exactly like he did in Robin and Sherwood. And you know, because he's a little bit different because he doesn't know us that well, as we're walking through um, the landscape, which, which was a landscape, by the way, where right out of the way, there's no sign of the modern world. You know, no roads, no, no telegraph wires, no nothing, Dove though. It's just this valley, there's a, a, a river running through it, there's caves, it's incredibly archaic. You can lose your whole sense of time there. But we're going along. And uh, Mark's kind of exactly like he was in Robin of Sherwood with, with Robin and the Merry Men, kind of keeping up the rear, so almost like he's on the lookout, looking around to see what's going on. And I, for me personally, it's a mind blow for everybody, of course it was, but for me personally, it was like something has snapped in man. You know, there is some kind of membrane that has just been broken through, and we have messed reality up completely. <laughs> and what the hell? It's going to happen now, you know. Now, one of the great things about all of this, you know, from the point of view, uh, you know, Mark didn't get involved in psychic questions, but he did meet up with the artist Chester Potter, and he did, um, you know, collaborate and help her to bring forth the legendary Greenwood Tarot, which is, is one of the absolute masterpieces of tarot. There is no question about this whatsoever. And, you know, Mark's connection, Mark's leaving the question, if you like, was his connection to Ellen. And with Greenwood Tarot, Cheska really brought forth in many of the images um, her sense that there was, along with this primal, archaic, um, horned god figure, there's also a horned goddess, and, and this is Ellen. And she was a tremendous important part of Question in those days, and, and that work has kind of expanded. So there was something absolutely awesome there. I mean, I don't think, from the point of view of Mark's work and all the rest of it, that you can put a cause and effect on it and say that because some of us did this bonkers thing at the Winter Solstice uh, with her and Clan Ed and the Wild Hunt, that that somehow caused Mark to appear. Mark would probably have talked to Andy anyway, but the rules tableau of how that played out was just absolutely and utterly exquisite and it, it did prime me with, a, with an emotional tone uh, about how reality is, is now configured on a magical level in the modern world in a way that you know the, the famous magicians of decades gone by uh, didn't quite have these options should we say they weren't aware that things were that way so that was, that was uh, foundational for me in, in how I, I kind of understood these things. Now I've mentioned um, there was a psychic called Debbie, Debbie Benston, and she was then Debbie Cartwright, as she is now. Her um, abilities were 
absolutely, absolutely extraordinary. And one of the little episodes that played out in the course of 1990 in the background of some of our other big quests that I felt it really necessary to at least give a nod to in my Atagardis um, book concerns were what we call the Dream Warriors. Now, Deb had a very strange talent. You know, she claimed that she could basically go into people's dreams and she would be completely conscious of what was going on in there and she could lead you out of your own dream into somewhere and a, a, a whole, you know, magical whatever would go on in there and the next morning she could tell you all about it and you would know that that was what you had dreamt about. And she started getting um, into this, this pretty strange scenario where she believed that there was a, a dream demon that she called the Layak, and we later discovered that as a name for, uh, 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 I think it's a Malaysian demon. But anyway, this thing stalked the nightscape of certain people's dreams. And it was a little bit like the Nightmare on the Street sagas. So uh, she claimed that those movies, you know, had a certain level of genuine inspiration about them and were mutating the collective psyche in the background, whether we liked it or not. That basically, you know, people would find themselves in, in dreams that were like film sets, you know, in buildings, but buildings were just like one dimensional behind them, there was nothing. Lurking in the shadows would be some demonic entity that was kind of vampirising people, but that she was able to, to lead us against this thing because it was encroaching on what we were doing. And in our dreams, we had these alternative identities and she told us, you know, each one of us looked a certain way and had these particular powers. And it was kind of ridiculous because it was like, it was like comic book stuff, it was like something out of Thundercats, you know, we used to just laugh about it. Um, but Greta, but she came up with this thing, there was this entity that was going to help us and if we all slept in the same room together as often as possible, we all slept in a circle with our heads all pointing to the middle <laughs> and she recited this weird invocation, then uh, we could all dream together and fight off this thing. And, and yeah, we did this, we did this quite a lot of times and she called this thing Ash Polar and you know, we'd all be sleeping, ran out his house, say, uh, all in a circle. Now, when the face of the world is hidden in darkness, let's be conveyed to the place of our meeting, armed and armored, and let's be nourished by the power that is dedicated to the cleaving of darkness, the setting of all black matters, and the dissipation of all evil. So be it. And this is all pretty weird, and, and she would tell people what they'd been dreaming. Now, other people in the group remembered that. Yeah, she really was telling people what they had dreamt the night before. When she said, I came into your dream and I took you out or something, but we went there and we went there and this, that, the other turned up, people were remembering it. I, at first, wasn't. I just had to take people's word for it. But it got a bit weird, it got a bit heavy because people were having tussles with these things and their dreams and they were coming out with scratches all over them and bruises and shit and it's like, well, like you've done that to yourself. So, but there was an atmosphere around it. Um, and one night, uh, one of our Decoding's Earthquest meetings, I was giving a lecture on the ball and something or another, just like I am now. And Deb saw this creature turn up that was like some Aztec sacrificial victim with all flesh dripping off it and all the rest of it. It pointed at me and made some kind of curse and said, by the blood of my third father, I'm going to kill you. And I thought, well, this is a barrel of laughs, ain't it, you know? <laughs> what, what's all this about? But in terms of, of how do you anchor this to reality, me personally, at that point, I wasn't recalling what she said I was dreaming. But my father, uh, who had a real bad time in the Second World War, he had been out in the Far East, fighting the Japanese and so on, been wounded. He, had, he used to have nightmares. Uh, you know, these Japanese soldiers in the kitchen. He was still waking up, screaming 40, 50 years later. And during this time, the first chunk of 1990, because this is all the first half of 1990, the same period of time that Mark Ryan's appeared and all this is going on. 
His nightmares get worse and worse. And two days after this event, this guy's turned up cursed me. Uh, my father is thrashed about in bed and he, he literally throws himself out of bed and he hits the, you know, right at the edge of his eye on his bedside table. Fraction of a couple of millimetres different, he would have really done damage to his eye. The whole side of his face is all bruised up and I just think, nah, this, this is too close for comfort. This is getting a bit weird. But then, and this is where it gets difficult, um, we discover that there's a guy called Grant Master who's a, a horror writer, and he's written a series of novels, the most famous one of which is Night Warriors. And the whole theme of this is a bunch of people that are fighting demons in their dreams, and they've all got these special powers and all the rest of it. And the name of the entity that is helping them is Asher Polar, which is exactly the same as what Dead's come up with. And the invocation, because these guys all sleep together, the invocation that they use um, is pretty much exactly the same, word for word. And it's like, well, you know, come on in, Dead, you must have read this stuff. No, I have not read it, I have never heard of any of it. And, you know, she got, on one occasion, finally, she says to me something that was dreamt. And I remember, oh my God, that is what I dreamt last night, isn't it? You know, what on earth is going on here? Now, at that time, I didn't read um, Night Warriors, but I did get around to reading it eventually. Now, what was very, you know, interesting for me was uh, I kept dream diaries, I kept detailed dream diaries. I had a particularly unpleasant dream. I'm not going to say what the details were, but it was very particular, very, very distinct details that were odd, that were nothing to do with my life, my psyche at all. Three months later, I read finally Night Warriors for the first time. Quite early on in it, it's the exact scene that I dreamt. The exact scene that I dreamt. And this just gave me so much of a shock, so much of a cause to thought. I thought, you know, this is far stranger um, than appears to be the case. You know, I, I genuinely believe that they had not read these books and that something was going on. And in the end, I mean, it was absolutely absurd. I think it was September. We had a huge hunt down um, in St Paul's Cathedral one night. The, oh, the medieval knight William Marshall turned up and helped us. I think there was like the bird laid down, Mary Poppins was outside, there was demons all over the place. Supposedly, we can miss things off, but it was a very flipping strange scenario. And it's got to be said the Grand Master uh, is a strange case. Um, he is a guy, I think he, he knew him, uh, had a little bit of interaction with William Burroughs. Um, he wrote an awful lot of novels. I think he might have written for Penthouse at one point. But anyway, there's a lot of people. Uh, Graham Phillips had come up with a whole psychic scenario at one point in the late 1970s that involved the Allied armies of the D-Day making use, quite consciously, deliberately, General Pack and so on, of demons. Um, and, you know, in the fight against the cult Nazis and fighting fire with fire. And it later turned out that quite a lot of this is also the basic plot of The Devil's D-Day by Graham Marston. So what the hell was going on there? And during a period of time when I supposedly um, had some elemental um, cat being living with me, I, um, yeah, this is quite, this is quite a story in itself. Um, uh, we're just having a pause to change over the, uh, the film in there, just to the point we get to the end of it. Okay. okay. See, amongst Deb's wild talents um, was the fact that she could see strange elemental beings and so on. Came around my flat and sat there one day and said, you've got this weird, it's like a Tinkerbell sort of, <laughs> little bit of light, that sort of flies about the room, lands on your shoulder, and it's like this weird half human, half cat thing. It's got six breasts, but it's got a cat's head, and it's living on your shoulders, and it's something to do with the past life you had in Egypt, and the step privilege of Sakara, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'll just mention this was involved in the first part of my River Thames quest, and other people that know what that's all about. But anyway, obviously, this is bonkers, but I did, you know, I couldn't see it, but I interacted with it, and things happened that led me to believe there was some reality to it. And then it turned out that uh, creatures like this were part of Grandmaster's novel, The Sphinx. So 
Once again, basically the whole of, of, of 1990, the gold, gold neuropsychic question set me up with stuff in the background to think the, the fiction, novels, the TV, where all this comes from, that the, 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 there is not a whole false distinction there, that there are possibilities and they're already happening. So what the hell else could happen? <coughs> Now, Twin Pikes um, was first scraped um, in uh, 1991, but I missed the first of the episodes. I felt I, I didn't want to try and catch up on it. But in late 1992, you know, one of the most important bits of the story in Antigolite is when I took um, Sanyas as a ocean Sanyas as an energy initiation and it just put one hell of a lot of voltage into me. I did that in Glastonbury. The same weekend that this was happening, uh, there was a woman there who was a real Twin Peaks fan, and she said, I can't believe you haven't seen this. It is so full of the kind of things you'd like. You know, it's surreal, it's bizarre, it's, it's, it's very dramatic, it's full of surrealism, it's full of occult critiques. And I clocked it, and a friend of mine turned out a video mill, and he said, look, you know, I'll end it to you, you can start watching it. So, Right at the end of 92, beginning of 93, when I've got all kinds of voltage going through me, I, I start binging this, you know, I mean, in the early days, you know, now we're accustomed to Netflix binge watching, this is kind of part of that culture now, but in those days, watching 29 episodes of the TV series <laughs> in 10 days was, was about normal, you know, yeah, the basic theme there, you, you've got um, an FBI agent called Dale Cooper, to be on the one hand, he's almost straight out over the 1950s, but he's also into Jewish Buddhism, he pays attention to his dreams, and he comes into this town where there's a murder mystery, where there's a lot more going on than uh, immediately meets the eye, and he finds himself in, often in the indeterminate dreamlike zone uh, where um, there's a dwarf that talks backwards and in slow motion, and there's a giant who utters various prophecies about the elves not being what they seem and so on. And one of the most striking characters in it is, is the log lady. Now, the log lady, her husband had this tragic accident and died uh, shortly after they were married. Uh, and he, he, he worked in some place where they were logging, she keeps a log, and it somehow talks to her and she, she's able to utter prophecies and give advice to Dale Cooper. Now, a matter of days after I started watching this, I was coming home from a uh, sofa supermarket in South End after a day in the office, and this middle-aged woman was walking down the road towards me holding a dog. And I thought, what? You know, because this is already a couple of years after the series is screened. Now, here's the thing. Don't try the old selective attention thing on me, all right? There are not a bunch of women walking about. <laughs> This was weird, and the purpose of the log lady is often prophetic. Uh, you know, she, she moves the plot along by letting people know that there's going to be an outbreak of dark strangers and all the rest of it. And I felt, yeah, this is my little warning that, mate, carefully, you'll, you'll, you'll get plugged into something that may well, you've already got into your background and what can happen with Robin Shu and what the hell's going to happen with Twin Peaks, mate. <laughs> Now, one of the things about Twin Peaks is, 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 yeah, I love the way David Lynch works. There's a guy who's part of, of um, the crew uh, helping to film it, and his reflection turns up in a, in a mirror in one of the scenes they've shot, and David Lynch is so taken by it, he decides to write him into the plot, and this guy who plays this villain called Bob becomes one of the scariest villains in the other TV history, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. And Bob is able to kind of possess people to do bad things to kill people, you know, this is, is one of the, the themes about this, this story. Now I've, I've, you know, been going a week of solid stuff into this and I've got a, a bit of a, a domestic situation which I've talked about in one of my lectures to you guys before, just briefly rehash it, I've been able to have these crazy downstairs, I had this couple, um, the woman was um, obsessed with the basic rollers and used to play the basic rollers greatest is um, full volume, six times in succession, to such an extent that he literally made the 
floor will shake and it might do your bars and my electric fire vibrate. This can gun on any house in day and night. And I used to have Aussie technical space that you roll those walls with her because I had huge big old speakers. <laughs> and she put basic bowls and I would just turn my speakers down on the floor and put a stranger tube on full volume. This sort of stuff was going on. And she had a very volatile relationship with uh, her boyfriend. And you just never knew what was going to go on in there. And, and I'd had situations where I'd had to go down there and get pretty flipping full on with them to just shut up, you know, and, and get out of my face with it all. Now, as, as the Twin Peaks story goes on, um, what becomes interesting is the locale, the actual location, becomes uh, almost a character in its own right in a way that to me at least recalls how somebody like John Cooper Poe's weeds Glastonbury itself into his novel as a character in its own right. And the character that led to this place called the Owl Cave in Ghostwood Forest, which is just outside of, of, of Twin Peaks. And I'm watching this on a particular Saturday night, you know, in January, and as they're getting um, as they go in there, they find this design, this design on the wall, and when somebody accidentally hits the middle of it with a pickaxe, all kinds of stuff stops happening. Now I'm watching this, and there's this climactic scene as, as they, they hit this thing, another enormous design is revealed, and owls start flying, and there are road figures, and there's a scene where there is a road figure with an owl just flying out of its head. Now, as I'm watching this, there's this enormous, like, crashing, bashing sound downstairs, and there's all this kerfuffle, and something's going on outside. This is classic Essex style going down. <laughs> and then somebody says, Oi! And then there's like a pause, a pause, and then then again, Oi, I said, Oi, all right. And, I'm thinking, and it's clearly there's, there's a fight going on, literally, right outside my front door. Someone has, has the, the, the front doors of both the flats, me and the people downstairs, this has been, been smashed in, something's going on, and I'm kind of peering out the curtains while there are owls flying out of these rogue figures on one side. I always watch TV in the dark, I never like so I like the cinema effect. So all this going on, looking out, I can't tell what's going on, there's this kerfuffle, and I'm like, this is Essex, mate. You know, if you if you see something like this and they clock you, you might go in trouble on your hands. You know, I heard a story only a couple of miles away where a guy had seen something going on outside his flat, there were violence, these guys had clocked him, they literally kicked, kicked the front door into the block of flats, got upstairs, kicked his door, with, beat him up, smashed his TV cell. I'm not having any of that, am I? So, you know, I've done back inside and I've got this scene playing out on my TV set up and shit, man, this is intense. Where is this going? You know, where the hell is this going? Now, this is the this is the glyph that is revealed on, in the alcove, and this is the explanation. And you'll notice that there's a little circle of trees called Glastonbury Grove. And this is only revealed. There's 29 episodes of, of Twin Peaks. I think it's only the 28th episode that we get as far as as, as Glastonbury Grove is up. And this is actually what it is. Um, in the daylight, it's a circle of 12 sycamore trees, and there's this weird sort of patch of, of black oil uh, around it. And when you see its curtains, what this lets you know is that Glastonbury Grove is the portal to either the black or the white lodge. There's a mythology that goes through it, it goes through the story, and it, it, it gradually gets deeper. That basically, where the source of all the problems, the source of all these issues, is this area where, depending on whether you've got love or hate in your heart, what level of purity you bring to when you enter the Black Lodge, you either come out, you know, um, evil or, or, or transformed and transcended. So it's the pool area, it's the centre of the whole story, and, and there's um, a, a famous scene in it where basically you see. Um, as if in midair, coming from, from some other dimension, first of all the hand and then the face of Bob actually appears to come out and pull the glass to the grove. Uh, um, this is from the return, by the way, that the screen book screen last year. And I, I became aware that there was all, it wasn't 
this wasn't just my pride at university because I lay when I moved to Glastonbury, um, I met some people who were around and used to watch Twin Peaks in 1991 and they were doing a bit of tree forestry and stuff out near um, Park Wood at the centre of the Glastonbury Zodiac and they just part pro planted uh, a little bunch of sycamore trees and then they came up that night and they saw this whole thing about the sycamore trees and Glastonbury Grove for the first time and, and obviously it freaked the shit out of them but you know there's more you know it turns out this intensity bias because Doug Cooper goes into the lodge goes through the dimensional doorway and in one of the most famous and weirdly harrowing endings of a TV series ever um, he seems to either be possessed by Bob or he becomes a doppelganger and because they were going to do a third series but it was never funded and so this bleak, bleak ending echoed in the height of space of 25 years until the return last year. But in the interim, over the years, this whole Glastonbury Grove thing has become quite a big deal. Um, you can get the t-shirt, you know, people don't get into this stuff pretty full on, you know, tattoo it on your, on your arm. What? Uh, and more now that we've, we've got the return and, and just an enormous great, you know, internet thing related to every last single bit of Twin Peaks, yeah, there's the Lego version of the in Minecraft, somebody's done it, and I think we've got this one person here who's got the Twin Peaks Tarot, so they'll see that that's the Wheel of Fortune, it's Glastonbury Grove, and you know, people in America, there's people that have constructed it in their garden for God's sake, you know, so it's kind of built up this, this kind of bulge, but right the word go, um, I had my own kind of, as I was watching it at the start of 1993, as all this weird stuff is going on downstairs for me, and as we get through to the final bit of the series, like it's very disturbing uh, associations, and this is, this is part of wood, okay, which is um, at the centre of the Glastonbury Zodiac. Uh, many of you know it, probably quite a few of you uh, have actually been there. This is, is me with the Morwood Moat. Um, hatching out what ultimately becomes the signs and secrets of the Glastonbury Zodiac anthology uh, a few years back. Uh, I couldn't find, um, I used to have some better photos of the whole area. There is a definite grove in the middle of Polwood. You know, there's, there's no doubt about it. It's a very atmospheric place. And I've got a big history with Polwood uh, that goes back to psychic questing. Um, ceremonies that Andy did that was supposedly of nice temple of vintage, stuff that we did actually, uh, you know, we did an incredible meditation there with the Morwood Moon at the time of, of the Grand Cross, I think in August 2010 that I led, so I've got a lot of associations with it. And it's a place that um, over the years, um, you know, it's had a very simple question of its own, yeah, the alchemy of light and dark and all the rest of it. Over the years, various travellers have lived in there and so forth. And it was kind of intriguing, you know, a friend of mine uh, spent a little bit of time camping in there and she said, oh, there were these owls flying about in there and they sounded really weird, they just didn't seem like they were really owls. And one of the motifs in Twin Peaks is this message from the strange spectral giant, the owls are not what they seem. And, you know, this seems to be like a, a motif of a screen memory of something strange in, in ufological studies. Uh, you get it when we strive as communion, people would experience owls and in fact they haven't really seen an owl. What it is, is something that is keeping them from the memory of something even stranger. Now, back in 1990, you know, this is, is, is dark stuff, uh, indubitably, uh, there was a guy in Glastonbury who uh, was a self-professed black magician and he so basically he told everybody, he used to hang around in the assembly rooms and he chiefly told everybody that he'd got to kill this together and he was going to go out and he was going to kill people in secrets. He'd got an astrologically determined this. And the thing is he did actually make a start on this. Uh, there was a, a guy who was one of the travellers in Parkwood and he killed this guy just outside Parkwood in 1990 he was arrested. And this was a big thing, this was just before um, the Andy Collins group, myself included, went to a vision quest attempt in the Glastonbury Zodiac. I've read all 
about it now and I leave you on not talked about a lot of times. It was a big, big, big powerful experience for me. About a month later we came back. Um, we were kind of basically involved in I'm not going all the details, we called it a black question episode. It wasn't very nice. We were intending to stake out a few places thinking there were some nasties going down. But we intended to spend the night on Duncan Beacon, that's what we could do. And as we came back, as we came into town, uh, here is this amazing news. Because the guy responsible for this murder was busted out the back of a police wagon. And, and he's all in the freaking loose, man. You know, he's all in the loose. And I, I know there's somebody in this town still living here. I've talked to her about it. She was given place protection at the time because she was one of the people on his list. Uh, so we're all set up to spend the night on Dunham Beacon, right in the middle of nowhere, with a genuine uh, murder on the loose, who at least considers him to be himself to be some kind of black magician. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it to, to the scholars to decide whether he really was one or not. But you know, the hell to tell you if he's killed somebody. We're all out there. So we're obviously a bit freaked out. There's a certain frisson, isn't there, when you're spending the night out in the middle of nowhere with a escaped murderer on the loose and you're involved in an occult episode. So one of that group, uh, like Johnny been in the army, this was his excuse to set us up in an old camp up there. And he crawls around in his camouflage gear and he puts all these trip wires down and he picks up these big stones and puts them up in trays and all the rest of there. And we've got all these fucking weapons and stuff and it's absolute bonkers. And, and this hippie couple out for a little stroll um, at sunset, one of them trips the wire and it's down, just lands right there to them. And we think, oh dear, now maybe not. Maybe it's not going to be a way to go this and take this. Uh, so we took it all down and we just spent the night. And I will say, as part of that moment we were, that we did a Dream Warriors uh, scenario that night. We did actually all sleep uh, in a circle and do the full Ash Polar thing at the same time that all this was going on. And in the middle of the night, um, it's a picture of us the next day, actually. Uh, it's all a bit blurry, but that's me now. This next day, we're out with our backs to the camera there. In the night, about 4 o'clock in the morning, there was a shotgun went off. Uh, I don't know what the hell it's all about. You can rationalise it and say it was a puncher or something or another. But again, you know, it adds a certain something to the feeling that you have a special night out camping around Glastonbury in the summertime. <laughs> so this, this really stayed for me, of course it did, and it led, to, led me to just think, what is going on here? Because when we think of, of, of Twin Peaks, everybody thinks of David Lynch, you know, he's the one that gives it the flavour, the surrealism, the strangeness, the dream-like aspects. But when it comes to the plot, when it comes to stuff like Glastonbury Grove, when it comes to Black and White Lodge, the guy that's really responsible for it is a guy called Mark Frost. Now, he first got going in um, with uh, the police procedure on Hill Street Blows, which I dare say a few of you will probably remember. A very tightly plotted, so he knew how to make something all hang together coherently like that. But he's really, really interested in, in occultism. And there was actually an interview with him in The Independent in August 1992, where he said that the inspiration for the theme of Black and White Lodge came specifically from the unfortunate psychic self defence. And he wrote a novel, came out a couple of years later, The List of Seven, uh, which, you know, the moment I knew about it, I devoured it because I was really intrigued. What was, and this is, this is a nice bit of art, by the way, this is Whitby Abbey. And there are, um, there's a few things that gets wrong. At one point, he's got Dion Fortune in a scene with Blavatsky, which is a bit unlikely, but he's like, when she died the same year that Blavatsky was born, he's also got Dion Fortune wearing a monocle, which doesn't quite work either. But there's a shed load of stuff in there. And what I found really weird, and it's a home, it's an absolute whipping yard. You know, you've got, you've got um, roots of Nazi cultism in the late 1980s, you've got stuff with Whitby Abbey, you've got stuff in London. There was a whole bunch of stuff in there that was also part of that question work. Um, that's, it's a shame, it's not very good. Um, there's no good versions of Andy Second Coming cover anywhere else. You've got one on his own website, but that's at the bottom, that's Whitby again. 
You see, there was a whole bunch of stuff in there. And I thought, where? Where is Janice from? You know, do I believe that he's read these books? Do I believe that he might have known about what happened in Paul Woods in 1990? I don't think he did. I think now, you know, the investigation of the sources of all of this stuff, Twin Peaks fandom is absolutely obsessional. If Mark Frost had known anything about that stuff, he definitely, we'd know about it by now, we definitely would. So what's going on? There is some something in, in the collective mind that inspires on the one hand the so-called artists and on the other hand psychics and occultists and magicians and it shows you that there isn't this whole, whole boundary line between them. It's very, very important that. So here's Mr. Love Lovecraft. This is a little story I've got with this right and this is not actually an artist but I've talked about this one a, a, a few times. Lovecraft, the man whose, whose dreams inspired his stories, and people like Kenneth Graham have suggested that he dreams true on a magical level, and that the, the entities that he dreamed about are, uh, in some extent, uh, a magical reality. And his most famous story, uh, my famous story, this is a shadow over his mouth, where there's this American town where the people who live there have made a kind of pact with these entities, these fish beings that live below the sea, and there is breeding that goes on between them, and a race of people that have always used but gradually acquire fish characteristics and end up going into the sea, uh, result from this, and it's, it's famous in horror fiction, and a number of people have kind of done their own riff on it, loads of people do their own little version of them, inspired by Ian's mouth myth, I certainly it was a all of us on the questing group, we love Lovecraft and we, we love the Innsmouth story. Now, in uh, 1994, a friend of mine um, was hoping to move down to Cornwall and he's very psychic. And one day he's at uh, some brick and brown place, some antique sphere or whatever, and he finds this huge cold shell. And he picks it around that, so he puts it on a table right next to his bed at night. As he's going to sleep, he's, he, yeah, he's not like he's even put it up to his ear, but he can hear the sea and he feels himself going into this kind of dreamy space. And it's like he's being taken down to the sea and he's going to meet, you know, something or another that's under the sea. Uh, and this seemed to be leading him onto Cornwall. Now, I think it was a Fortnight later, I was in South End Library and I got this. I, I don't know why I was inspired to get this Brian Lumley Return of the Deep Ones, and it's, it's a it's a his mouth homage. Uh, and it's set in Cornwall, uh, where basically you've got the fish people and villages like his mouth only in Cornwall. And the story starts off with uh, the main protagonist. Uh, and it's always the case with these stories that the main protagonist realises unbelievably that they are going to turn into a fish being themselves and, and this inevitably happens. The main protagonist uh, finds this enormous great cold shell uh, and is inspired to buy it and puts it in their bedroom and last thing at night, you know, they start hearing the sea and they start being drawn into these watery realms where they feel that they're going to, you know, at this point I'll bring my mate up and sit well, you know, just take it easy, yeah, man, take it easy. And I told him what I'd say, uh, what I'd read, and he did kind of put the brakes on, um, but he did move to Cornwall, and here's, here's a little something, something that, that, that might be uh, interesting for those of you that know uh, our great artist, Yuri Leach, maybe some of you couldn't quite picture him out in a boat in Cornwall in the middle of the night, and the wall was trying to invoke the Cornish sea monster Morgul, but indeed he did do so, um, <laughs> along with my friend who did end up moving to Cornwall despite the love of crafty and warnings. So there is again this, this richness, you know, once, once I think you've been amongst a community of people where this membrane has been broken and this apparent barrier <coughs> between facts and fiction is gone, then you realise that all sorts of things um, are, are starting to become possible. So now we move into um, the realm of something that's a slightly different category.
because Dale Fulton's Psych Process is a novel that is written with a magical intention. It's, uh, it's intended to convey certain magical truths that cannot be conveyed, or at least to her, couldn't be conveyed through the conventional means. She'd written a great book, The Mystical Kabbalah, but she felt that to explain it, um, she would tell stories, she would write novels. And the same process, I think, for a lot of people uh, is their favourite. And by the way, this is probably my favourite um, cover version of it. Uh, I think that's very, very redolent. Now, this is Chester Potter, by the way. Uh, Chester Potter's a magician. Uh, that's my dad in the background, which is the physical location of the sea process. This is the sea process. Some of you, well, probably a lot of you, will recognise this as being featured on the cover of Alan Richardson's uh, original uh, version of his biography of the unfortunate process. Now, the story basically is how, in modern times, sort of ancient, ancient karma that in the novel is considered to go back as far as Atlantis is played out in the modern age. And Dear Fortune has, has made a point of, of weaving a magical mythology around the entire landscape. You know, break down is the centre of gravity of this story. And she's given, you know, names that connect up supposedly with Atlantis and so on to a whole bunch of her of sites around that particular locale. So, bear in mind she's a visionary, bear in mind she's a seer, and, and that she's a trained occultist. Um, there's kind of a sense of to what extent is she accurately, psychically picking up that this was the place full of this kind of flavour way back when. Now, you know, with, with the novel, um, she puts it back to Atlantis. You know, basically there are sacrificial rites to the sea, uh, and connected with flooding and the tides and how they claim the land and so on and that the inhabitants of the area were sent for, for a specialised sea priestess who would come and demand sacrifices <coughs> and then all everything be sorted out. Now Deborah used to say that whenever the unfortunate spoke of Atlantis really she made me think sort of Babylonian or something along those lines and, and the Near Eastern cultures of, of shortly or more recent you know, if you thought in those terms it was maybe more useful than to go back as far as Atlantis, maybe that wasn't historically the case. But one way or another, this story has touched people. And there's a, a ceremony that is portrayed in the novel involving a fire uh, of Azrael, where you've got to make this fire right on the edge of the, 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 the water at the time. The tide is about to come in a particular woods and you do divination in it and so on. It's really, really beautiful. Now, back in um, 1990, the golden weird year of 1990, when um, we were in the midst of, you know, dream warriors and, and a couple of weeks before the Dundon Beacon escape murder episode, um, the moon ritual group decided that we were going to do the sea priestess ritual. And it's another pause. Okay, so Alex Langstone had checked out an area in Patterson, right on the extremes of the Essex coast, that perfectly met the criteria for the performance of Secret Priestess Ritual. Absolutely miles away from anybody. So we decided that we would go out there. Um, by the way, the fragments that are there in the Secret Priestess model, Janet Stuart Farrer in the Witch's Bible. Created um, a workable ceremony, a seashore uh, ceremony, I think they call it, in the Witch's Bible, and we use that as, as the basics. You know, we wove a little bit of our own interesting stuff, but we use that. And by this stage of the game, we were completely given <coughs> over to the whole witchcraft mythology. Uh, we all got the, the robes and the swords and the flying ointment and the incense and everything and we even quite a few people were going to go for this and we even made a point of meeting some of them at the crossroads at midnight just just for the jollies just for the witchcraft jollies just really laid on thick 
So we're right out in the middle of nowhere. And, and this thing is done to flipping perfection. Um, we've all got the robes and, and the swords and the incense, the blah, blah, blah. We've got the five ace rope and it's all done right at the water's edge and literally the timing on it could not be better. The tide comes in, puts out the fire at the exact right moment, the exact right moment. And, and as we're um, invoking ISIS, the clouds clear, there's the full moon and it couldn't have been better. We were just completely in another world, all because there was nothing of normal life was anywhere there. You know, your senses are fully engaged, you've got the incense, you've got a whole bunch of stuff that is just relevant and another reality altogether, pure magic. And we're totally spaced. And I didn't get home until I know off two in the morning, something like that. And I was I was so tired, I was so out of it. I all I wanted to do was literally just take my shoes and take my coat off and fully clothed, just fall back on the bed and just pass out unconscious. But some Mr. Sensible voice in my, my head says, No, nah, Paul, you know, you've burnt the candle at both ends here, mate. You need to have a cup of hot chocolate cool plant before you go to bed. I'm not, not over 30 years old, it's not six tenths bastards on a Saturday night anymore. You've got to look after yourself, mate. So, Mr. Sensible has his cup of hot chocolate cooler, and this changes the timing of when I would have gone into the bedroom. I'm in the bathroom, I'm cleaning my teeth, and there is the enormous great shaking. The entire house shakes with this enormous great crash. And I think, what is this? You know, run out of the bathroom with the toothpaste rotten out of my mouth. It sounds like it's come from my, my bedroom. It's the wardrobe falling out of what the hell. I, I, I try to enter my, my bedroom and I carry it. I have to push. There is something stopping me opening the door and I just back in the light. I stick my head in. About a third of the bed of the ceiling has, has caved in. And there's all this stuff all over the bed. I, I just don't know, you know, there's a loft above me, I don't know how the hell it was that the stuff that had come down was so substantial. I, I filled up dusty bags full of it the, the next day. But the fire of Asra, is the ancient of death and you're divided between the worlds. I've just done this stalking great ceremony, which concluded it with the fire of Asra. I've come home, if, I, if I'd just gone straight to bed that thing, I would have been mashed potato to waste down, because I would have been in big trouble. But something's kind of looked out for me, and I thought, I just calmly thought, well, you're not going to sleep in here tonight, are you? So I just got some, went in the living room, got a sleeping bag, slept in there. Now, how has that worked? I, I knew, I had noticed there was this very faint crack in the ceiling that had been there for a while. And now it's the summer, and now it's like kind of breathe in and breathe out. But whatever the hell, that thing, the ceiling's come down straight after I've done the sea priestess ritual for it. So, you know, it's clearly the result, ain't it? And it's a measure of how bonkers I was that we actually thought of going down to bring down a couple of months later and doing the whole thing down there right in situ where the deal fortune is normal was and we had a whole contingent of us all going to go down there for the old Equinox. And it was quite comical because that morning a whole bunch of stuff started happening like somebody's big mirror falls off the wall and breaks and I think, no, 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 I'm not doing it. that's a bad omen, I'm not going. I can't remember all of it, but in the end, there was literally only me and Alex next day. We went all the way down from South End to Bleak Down, and we got there late at night, and we hadn't checked it out, we hadn't been down there, we didn't really know what we were doing. We were thinking, we really put a light of fire to the ocean of death right out of the edge of this great Lord Promontory in the dark, but we hadn't even looked at it, and there's this you know, great crashing waves of British Channel down there. No, we're not. Let's get out of there. And that was one of the very few times something but there was a sense that there's more to come you know this this, this spring down is, is a, a tremendously you know power oh, nice that guy it's actually yeah we're now going to move into the, the, the center of gravity of, of what's in the that guy's story because this connects up with the whole sea priestess saga so we've come back and there's this sense that there's something uh unfinished business with the sea priestess it's clearly very powerful stuff uh, but we, if we try to think about it, we'll waste that time. It'll play out all in the morning. When it's supposed to. So it's now early 1993, and I've just been through my ultra peaks watching 
I had all of that weird, weird stuff going, it's all very disturbing. And part of the whole dynamic at the time, I'd been in an intensive scenario, um, I hesitate to call it a relationship because it didn't conform to any normal relationship standards with a lady who I'm calling Dara after a roadshow, show, Sanyas, name. Uh, we supposedly got Babylonian past life, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's this kind of new age fantasy of twin souls and twin flames, and if I only met somebody that I'd been in a past life with, it'd be all flipping unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> a lot of people who have actually been through that scenario and done that world, that ain't the case, man. You can, if you actually do get into a situation like this, it's quite a way to strip your head off. And that was pretty much what was going on with, with me. Uh, uh, and Alex Langstone was part of the whole scene as well, picking up psychically on a lot of stuff. But anyway, we started the new year and, and Don had got in a bit of a weird one and was out of the picture. Uh, and Alex suddenly started getting visions of um, the Thames Estuary, of Margot Seashell Grotto, and of a Phoenician priestess that was calling herself Seleucum Starley. And a whole scenario that was going on there, circa 900 BC, that was roughly what he was talking about, involving some sea serpent energy that had gone walking the donkey, it was being pumped up the wrong way, and there was some nasties going down, and it was karma to work out there. Now, all of this is in the book, and a whole consideration of, of Near Eastern goddesses, um, Ashi Ra, Tanir, a star, Ishtar, Inanna, the whole thing. Eventually, we're kind of we're, we're led to, to our guys, and we're, there's a date, February the 21st, which we've been told is a feast of our guys, and we have a feeling that we've got to sort this thing out by then. And it's only a couple of days before this is supposed to happen, and I haven't heard anything from Donna, but she brings me up. And I don't tell her anything about this cycle of this thing from Starley because we kind of believed it was a past life of hers, but we didn't want to tell her anything, about her anything about it. Let's see where she, what she comes up with herself. And she said, oh, I've, I've been seeing all these scenes, underwater scenes, mermaids, dolphins. This is all part of the cultist of our guys. And I think that we've got to go somewhere um, this coming weekend. Somewhere beyond Glastonbury, I can see this kind of, um, you know, cliff sticking out into the sea. It's out a little bit further in the West Country. Now, the minute I finished talking to you, I knew that well where it was. I knew it was break down. And I had been thinking about the, uh, the sea priestess because we were all centered down the other end of the country. It was all kicking, it was all going on around Margate, around the Thames Estuary, some of it was happening uh, on Agri Downs, the place where we used to do our full moon ceremonies, there was just a whole bunch of stuff going on there. But suddenly, <coughs> because Donna didn't know the secrets this story, you, you know, she didn't even, we never really talked, there was so much stuff going on in those days that the stories of us and the priestess, we never even talked about that. She didn't know what the associations were, but she was saying, go there on this day, which she also didn't know was the so much feast of our guys. So it's like, yeah, the minute we thought of, you know, the story that Alex had come up with, the psychic story of this priestess of the sea down at the, at the mouth of the Thames Estuary, who wore, uh, 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 the story was that me and Alex uh, um, uh, were brothers uh, back in, in the Phoenician homeland where there were sacrifices to the old colors around them to sacrifice the children and we'd refuse to be part of it and our father who was the king had ordered us to be killed and blah blah it was a whole karmic sacrificial thing and once we kind of plugged that in with the sea priestess they seemed to kind of all resonate very very strongly and it was like okay this Selenka is like a sea priestess character and we were now you know plugged in to do this thing so we all cut down and spend a you know spend Saturday night at BB at Western Supermare and then we're on our way up. You know, many of you will know this location, you have to go up these, these steep stairs and there we are on the that's what where you immediately find yourself is in that vicinity that there was in late 
uh, Ravana Bridge times, um, when some of the old Kelly days were getting revived, there was a temple there, only, only there for about 50 years. We're uncertain what the dedication is. Yuri seems to think that it might be something to do with, with Brig, uh, Bride Bridget, that broad goddess form. Mm -hmm. But there we are, and as, as you go on, um, you see in the distance this ruined army form that was built in the late 19th century. And in Dion Fortune's novel, um, the main protagonist, Wilfred Maxwell, really styles this whole place as a home for Vivian Le Fay Morgan, who is um, the ageless sea priestess, the reincarnation of the, of the, uh, the Atlantean priestess, who comes here um, to work a whole load of magic that takes things through all of the karma, transcends it uh, on another level of the game, whereby <coughs> various things relate to polarity magic, male, female, and the, and the revival of the divine feminine, the goddess, it is all able to occur. But, so there's this enormous great association, but when we went out there in, in February 1993, on the first of our guys, it was not our intention to just go through the deal fortune motion again. You know, both Alex and Don were incredibly psychic. We, we just trusted to our own intuition as to how this would, would play out. Now, right on the edge of the, of the, of the cliffs is these, these gunning placements. And what you find, if you're lucky, if it's a good day, if you go into one of them, you can mock up the sense of a classical temple pretty damn easily. You know, and it was in there, in that very one there, that um, we went about our business that morning and really just involved us sitting on the edge. And Darwin immediately saw us um, standing behind ourselves, only in our Phoenician form and so on, and Alex, who had a particularly bad sacrificial scenario in, in his past life, he started reliving it. He was literally blind, he couldn't see, and he thought his wall was filling up, his lungs were filling up with all this liquid, and there was this huge, great gaping wound in his back, and he was literally howling, he was having a scream of bummer, man. Uh, and, and Dana, who, who, who supposedly in a past life had been a priestess that guy's, and, and was disconnected from all of that, she was looking out at the Bristol Channel and she started to see all these eyes in the water and she started to get a sense of, of like what you could call Kundalini sea power for want of better terminology and she started to feel a physical transformation coming on that she literally had gills and she was starting to mutate. At this point, this enormous great wave of energy comes up from the sea and literally shoots up her upper body between her legs and up the top of her head. And in a second, it's like she's fully re-engaged and is able to help Alex and take him through a whole thing psychically and just talking through it and take him out the other side of it. And this was all instantaneously, you know, the whole thing was, was played out in a matter of moments once it had properly kicked in. And, and when we were on the way back down there, I was having a laugh about basically saying, you know, you've now got the material for some new age workshop that you can sell for two hundred Americans out of six and so, you know, I thought that was a pretty, pretty good deal that we could work out one day. But this whole thing had played out to perfection. And in terms of the sense of, you know, where does it come from? You know, Dion Fortune knows that she's reading a story, but it's a magical story, it's a cult story, it's a story of karma, it's a story of all kinds of things. Alex came up with a story that had such power, such compulsion, that, you know, if there were things about it that didn't quite seem to work out historically, we noted that for the record, but the sheer dynamism of the thing we had to get over to it. We would have, if, if when it first started, we'd have just said, well, this is all going lightly, and I don't think that's quite right, and oh, that doesn't seem to check out historically. I don't, we better not have anything more to do with this, and let's do something else. We would have been complete idiots to do that. We would have missed one of the great, great processes of the whole of our lives if we'd have done that. And this, you know, forms the climax of the Adonis story. But um, when I was writing it, it, you know, the way it worked out, the way I was able to actually launch it to manifest it to it published for the 25th anniversary. That really overrode all of my other kind of sense of how the book was going to go. It was around that last October when I knew that there was an occult conference on and I knew I could launch it that way. I just put myself to 
towards it. They didn't do it that. Um, it kind of slightly changed format. Now, I don't know too much into this, but I, I was very much influenced by Jeffrey Kroeber's Mids and Mystics, which is all about um, the paranormal in, in comics and popular forms of culture in America, American movies, and all the rest of it, Marvel comics, all this sort of stuff. I have got a few quotes from Kripal in there about Willie Strider, which are really kind of like a nod to people that maybe know his work to say that I'm, I'm aware of it and the possible implications for my own material here. Because Kripal talks a, a lot about um, channeled work, a lot of stuff that you got at the end of the 90s, the beginning of the 20th century, Blavatsky's material on Atlantis and Lemuria, people that remember Lemuria, people that remember Atlantis. Uh, and obviously all these stories have a certain amount of content, but there's always loads that's different about them. And it's like, they're telling a story and it's kind of like a fiction, but it's not, because there are people who connect with this on such a powerful level that you can take it as reality. You know, Andy Collins, when he wrote about Atlantis, talks about an Atlantis at the heart, like Dion Fortune talks about an Avalon at the heart. The, you know, you're not necessarily dissing the believers in Atlantis by putting something else out, but there is this sense that there is this emotional mythology, and, and where is it coming from? What is, where is it being generated from? This is one of the things that is most fascinating, and why do certain things hang in the airways as the zeitgeist at a particular time? You know, why is, is something as psychoactive as Robin Asher would manifest at a certain time? What leads? A combination of figures like David Lynch and um, Mark Frost to come up with, with Twin Peaks. The thing that, um, you know, for people that might be interested in reading this, you see, Crypal uh, is a great chronicler of the Asylum Institute and its whole history. And at the same time, he was very much inspired, like I was, by the early X Men comics in the 60s. I mean, I learned, you know, about psychokinesis and a whole bunch of paranormal stuff from the original X Men comics. And a whole generation of people did, and he kind of realised that the themes that were running through uh, evolutionary mutants, you know, it's part of the, of, the, of the mystical mainstream right back 100 years, but it gets amplified when you have the atomic era and, and so many of the early superheroes come into contact with radiation and so on. But there's, there's something going on here. Where are these stories coming from? Um, I won't go too much into that, but I'll simply say that where I'm left with is that kind of, um, you know, the inspirational takeaway, if you like, is the fact that what it makes you realise is that, to a greater or lesser extent, we're all plugged into this creative space where mythology is coming from, where stories are coming from. We're engaged in the creation of the story of our own lives, of course we are. Uh, and there are degrees to which we are not aware of that, and we are other people plug in some bits of scripts and so on. But when we take responsibility for it, and we decide that we are the hero or heroine of our own mythology and that we've got the, the whole of the world's cultural resources, the whole of history and everything, and that includes the future, that includes you know, any of our science fiction that we can imagine, is all the emotional fuel for our own mythos. If we start to realise that you know, we're engaged in the writing of the story, you know, when, when we got involved in our version of Sea Priestess, through this past life, whatever it was. You know, the, the payoff for me is that every reason I thought we realised was a very powerful magical mystical experience in the end, which was connected me to you know, my complete timeline and possibilities. We're, we're all engaged in this to a certain extent, and we had the option of becoming more and more conscious of that because you know, clearly these creative artists, Richard Carpenter, Robert Stewart, Lynch, Frost, they have shaped the myths that have become part of some content in the back of our collective mind. Who is to say that any one of us in this room cannot do the same, that we cannot consciously, deliberately, I mean, we've got to be connected to real inspiration. You can't just do it as an intellectual formula, but if you are connected to sources of inspiration, your own distinct talents, you know, your own star, your own true world, who is to say that you cannot be part of the creation of the myth that would inspire, you know, the world now and future generations, that there are not people in 50 to 100 years' time who will not be tuning in 
and get your own knowledge types and your own ideas that have been shaped by how you do it. And you have responsibility in that because you know you can go over to the dark side of the force or, or you can somehow you know create something that is transcendent and, and liberation. But what I, I hope I've conveyed here is, is the extent of fluidity, the extent of slack, the extent of mystery, mystery that is here, and that is a very compelling mystery. And for those of you, of course, who would like to read lots more about all of this, um, you know, my book out guys uh, has been launched. This is part of the launch process, the launch process. And of course, I've got some cookies over here, and I'll be happy to sign them for you for anybody that would like one. But for now, thank you so much for being here. It's been an absolute blast to be able to come out and do this one tonight. Yo to you all.